Hello. Welcome to today's event, the Caucasian Albanian Palimpsest and Cultural Erasure in Nagorno-Karabakh, Artsakh. My name is Laura Storian, and I'm delighted to host tonight's session. As Dr. Christina Moranci's November 2020 article in the Wall Street Journal states, in the aftermath of the recent Nagorno-Karabakh war, cultural heritage is in the crosshairs once more. Active destruction of Armenian churches and captured territories is already underway. Most recently, the bell tower and dome of Ganat Jam Church in Shushi, or Shusha. Moreover, it is part of a well-documented pattern of cultural genocide by Azerbaijan, including in the region of Nakhichevan, as documented uh, in Hyperallergic and The Guardian. In its physical and narrative erasure of the ancient indigenous Armenian presence in the region, one of the tools used by the Azerbaijani state is the Caucasian Albanian theory, which is instrumentalized in various ways. Affirmation of Azerbaijani history, physical erasure of Armenian traces in the region, and relabeling of Armenian churches as Caucasian Albanian. Today's panel explores the actual Caucasian Albanian history around Nagorno-Karabakh and highlights the ways in which it is manipulated by the Azerbaijani state in its well-documented cultural erasure of the Armenian presence in the region. Our distinguished speakers' presentations will analyze this issue from different but complementary perspectives. First, Dr. Vahe Tashchan will address the history of the Caucasian Albanians and the history of their manipulation or the manipulation of their existence in Azerbaijani historiography. Next, Yelena Ambartumian will discuss, among other aspects, specific sites that are at risk in Nagorno-Karabakh and will highlight precisely how they are at risk. In other words, which of their elements are likely to be destroyed. Finally, Dr. Mashinka Firunzhagopian will approach the topic through an art historical and critical race perspective. She will address the broad implications in the destruction of monuments that attest to Armenian indigeneity, as well as the role of Azerbaijan's cultural erasure of Armenian ind indigeneity in the wider campaign to make territorial claims on the region. So we have three speakers speaking in that exact order. And our first is Dr. Vahe Tashjan. Born in Lebanon, he earned his PhD in history and civilization at the École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales, EHESS, in Paris. His research covers the period of the French occupation of Cilicia, Syria, and Lebanon between the two world wars, Armenians in the Ottoman Empire, and refugee problems in the Middle East. He's the chief editor of the Berlin-based Husha Madian website, a research project whose aim is to reconstruct the Ottoman Armenians' local history and memory. And I have to say, I'm a very big fan of this project and I encourage you all to check it out if you haven't already. Among Dr. Tashchan's main publications, he has authored La France en Cilicie et en Haute Mésopotamie aux confins de la Turquie, de la Syrie et de l'Irak, um, 2004, and Daily Life in the Abyss, Genocide Diaries, 1915 to 18, uh, 2017. He also served as the editor um, of Husham Adian's pub publication, volume one of Ottoman Armenians, Life, Culture, Society, 2014. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand it over to him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Zoravik, for this uh, invitation. Uh, <clears throat> So we are dealing here with an amazing case of uh, memory abuse, memory and history reconstruction. And we are seeing how uh, memory and history are modified in order to serve political and ideological interests. Uh, generally speaking, such cases are common in historiography or in the world of those who think that history and uh, memory are things that could be used uh, and abused. Uh, I come personally from the discipline of Armenian studies, and it will be fair to start with self-criticism. Uh, I mean, the field of Armenian studies is, is also affected by such examples of distortion and reconstruction. Uh, for example, as you said, Noor, I'm the uh, editor of Ushamadian website, and I'm always confronted with this issue. For example, uh, this issue is visible in the memory books written by the first generation of Armenian survivors of the genocide about their village life, about their town life uh, in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, these are 
wonderful books, wonderful sources about the lost village uh, uh, or town life uh, in the Ottoman Empire. But at the same time, you will notice that uh, most of the authors of these books, when it comes to describe their native and lost places, they do it with considerable exaggeration. Uh, for example, they had the most beautiful church in their village. This is their de descriptions. They had the most tasty uh, and healthy fountain water in, in, in their town. Uh, their birthplace uh, was inhabited by heroes uh, and so on. Therefore, we need to adopt a critical approach to such descriptions because we are dealing again here with cases of memory and uh, history deformation. Uh, concerning the issue of Caucasian Albanians, uh, the first thing that uh, I can say here is that the case here is much more serious. We are not talking here of a couple of scholars, I mean bad scholars, uh, who one day decide to write the history of a whole region on their own way or as they wish, but we are dealing here with a state-sanctioned memory project, and the state in this case is Azerbaijan. So Azerbaijan is simply following the path of other countries who also adopted state-sponsored revisionist uh, ideologies or cultural ideologies. Uh, a well-known example uh, was Soviet Union, uh, where almost every discipline was used for the glorification of the Soviet Union, the state ideology and policy. Another well-known example is Turkey, and this one uh, is uh, let's say much closer to the Azerbaijani uh, pattern. We know that in the 1930s, the Kemalist regime of Turkey started to re rewrite the history of the whole Anatolia, linking the new uh, Turkish identity with prehistoric civilizations that existed in the region. And uh, this way they started to consider that the Hittites, a kingdom that existed in the area starting 17th century BC, were Proto-Turks. In other words, they wanted to present uh, the present-day Turkey, uh, or uh, in their opinion, or uh, following this theory, uh, the present-day Turkey uh, was prehistoric from prehistoric times, a Turkish territory. Here, the Caucasian Albanian theory created by the Azerbaijani officials should be considered as another example of how historical facts. Uh, politics, memory, and fiction are intertwined. I think that it is necessary to make some historical qualifications here to understand how and why the Caucasian Albanian theory became a tool in the hands of the Azerbaijani officials. I will try uh, to be very brief uh, in the presentation of the historical events. First, there is no doubt that uh, a Caucasian Albanian people and the rich culture existed in this region. Moreover, a Caucasian Albanian kingdom prevailed in antiquity and in early medieval times. The exact territories covered by this kingdom is variable. We know that they covered territories north of the Kura River. Sometimes they included territories between Kura and Arax rivers, that means the regions of Artsakh and sometimes Sunik too, was included in this kingdom. Uh, for example, the main chronicler of the Caucasian Albanian history, uh, the, that, that history was, uh, is written in Armenian. Uh, the, the chronicler is Movses Garangat uh, He writes that uh, Artsakh was part of Caucasian Albanian kingdom in fourth and fifth centuries during the historical period of Christianization uh, of this region of Transcaucasia, including Armenia and uh, 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 the Caucasian Albanian Kingdom. What is important here is to say that it will be misleading to analyze the prehistoric ethnic composition of the kingdom through the lens of, uh, let's say, national ideologies, which are something rel relatively very modern. Uh, these are 19th century or 20th century concepts. In other words, different ethnic groups may coexist in early times within the boundaries uh, of a kingdom, autonomous province, or a principality. The allegiance uh, of the subject populations at that time was to the ruler, that means the king, the prince, the lord, and not to the uh, nation state, uh, uh, state nation, which was inexistent at that times. 
I will not go into details here, but the important thing is to say that Armenians and Caucasian Albanians had so much in common that could make any coexistence very possible. The most important factor was the religion. The pre-Christian pagan religion of both Armenians and Albanians was uh, very likely similar. Later, the Albanians accepted Christianity in the middle of the fourth century. That means almost at the same time as the Armenians. Moreover, the head of the Albanian church was consecrated by the Armenian Catholicos. That means there was some spiritual or canonical allegiance uh, to the Armenian church. And uh, in later period, uh, we will see that the Ar Albanian church was completely dissolved within the Armenian church. An important event for our narrative here took place starting seventh century and later with the Muslim invasions in the region, first the Arabs, then the Seljuks and so on. And during this whole period, those Albanians living mainly outside the territory of Artsakh were Islamized. The Albanian Christian ruling elites continued to exist in Artsakh and Sunik from the ninth to 13th centuries. They were operating in a region where the dominant culture was uh, Christian Armenian. And this is a period where there were already no traces of uh, Albanian written language. There were mixed marriages between members of local Armenian and uh, Al uh, Caucasian Albanian elites. This kind of mixed marriages existed even in antiquities as is uh, written in Movses Karant Vatsvatsi book. Uh, in other words, the ethnic Albanians of Artsakh and in some surrounding areas were Armenianized in the long run. And from this period on, Artsakh or Sunnic Armenian rulers, princes, Meliks, although some of them descended uh, from Albanian lineage, but they started to consider themselves as Armenians. You can find German lineage in the British royal family, but this doesn't change its British identity. Huh? So here we can already see the fabrication of one of the main points of the Azerbaijani ethnogenetic theory, as they say that the Armenians are newcomers in Artsakh and that they supplanted the ethnic uh, Caucasian Albanians. No. The coexistence of the two ethnic populations was from time immemorial. And as it happens frequently, the small group is absorbed uh, in the dominant culture and assimilated into it, as it was the case of Albanians living in Armenian environment. So the Azerbaijani theory simply erases important chapters of the history of Caucasian Albanians in order to fit the political narrative. Of course, the question arises, uh, why this kind of narrative? Uh, perhaps one of the answers is in the creation of the state of Azerbaijan itself. We know that in 1918, Azerbaijan was completely uh, a new state, something like a patchwork nation state. Of course, this doesn't mean that new nations do not work in history. That's not at all. This is not uh, my point here. What I want to emphasize here, such states are more inclined to create new collective myths of origin to reconstruct memory in order to, to distinguish themselves from their neighbors or other ethnic components of their own state. And the fabrication of the Caucasian Albanian theory serves exactly uh, this purpose. And to conclude, I will try to adopt rather an optimistic approach to the ongoing Azerbaijani-Armenian conflict. The Caucasian Albanian legacy is something undeniable in both Artsakh Armenian culture and history, as well as it prevails in many parts of Azerbaijan. In other words, if the political will exist on both parts of the conflicting camps, the Caucasian Albanian legacy could be easily transformed into a factor of peace and reconciliation instead of dividing and polarizing societies. I know that sounds irrational in present day immediate post war conditions, but at least we can try to draw our attention, perhaps in the near future, on values that Armenians and Azerbaijanis do share. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vahe. Thank you, Vahe, for your presentation and for getting us started today. Um, I'd now like to present our second speaker, Yelena Ambartsumyan, 
who is a New York attorney and founder of OriginArt.com, a collection management tool and online marketplace for contemporary art collectors. Before founding Origin, Yelena was a senior associate at Millbank LLP, where her practice involved transborder disputes, business litigation, and internal and government investigations. Yelena has authored several publications relating to art and cultural heritage law, including the dispute between the Armenian church and the Getty Museum over the lost Armenian canon tables, and courts find dealers are not your friends, due diligence requirements for purchase purchasers of artwork, as well as assisted Judith Proda with Visual Arts and the Law, a handbook for professionals uh, for Sotheby's Institute of Art. Yelena has also written on Armenia and Artsakh for publicorthodoxy.org, and her research on Caucasian Albanian historiography as it relates to several monasteries in Artsakh will be published in the coming weeks. Yelena also co-chairs the Armenian Bar Association's UN Initiatives Group, and since the Artsakh War has resumed and now ended, well, since then, her volunteer work with AGBU, for which she served as a, uh, she resumed, sorry, she has resumed her volunteer work for AGBU since the Artsakh War, um, and for which she had served for the AGBU as permanent representative to UNDPI from 2008 to 2011. Uh, so thank you so much, Yelena, for joining us. We are really pleased to, to be able to share your work with our audience. Great. Can you hear me OK? Mm -hmm. um, so in spite of my uh, biography, I am by far the least educated person on this panel. Uh, having only had seven years of uh, education after high school. And so for that reason, I'm going to be including in my remarks several anecdotes, which I hope can provide some context about uh, the Armenian identity, the Azerbaijani identity, and uh, the cultural monuments that are at risk. I've decided to split my remarks into two parts to better build off of Dr. Tatian's overview of Caucasian Albanian historiography. Um, first, I'm going to address the concept of these com competing identities um, and also why the contours of Caucasian Albanian as an identity or as an ethnicity, as Dr. Tachjan alluded to, cannot be ascertained. Um, and next, I'll go into focusing on certain cultural heritage in Artsakh, Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, in territories that have been ceded to Azerbaijan, and I'll explain what exactly is at risk when we discuss cultural erasure meaning even if these monuments are still standing, uh, what distinctly Armenian elements or decoration are likely to be removed. So first on the concept of identity, uh, with respect to the Armenian identity, I don't think it'll surprise anyone to learn that the Armenian identity is a largely homogeneous one. It's based on a common ethnicity, a common language, a common religion, and a common historical experience. Um, and we can see this through key moments in the formation of the Armenian identity, which are one, Armenia's adoption of Christianity in the fourth century as its official religion, two, Armenia's rejection of the Council of Chalcedon in the fifth century, which separated us from the Eastern Orthodox Church uh, and later the Catholics, and also led to isolationism of the Armenian Church as we were incorrectly accused of being monophysites. Um, three, the creation of the Armenian alphabet in the fifth century. Uh, which allowed the Armenians to conduct their liturgies in Armenian rather than in Greek or Syriac, uh, which they were doing. Uh, and if you're interested in reading further about this, Michael Croissant, Nora Dudwick, and Michael Papazian have all discussed these three key moments in Armenian history and Armenian identity at length. Um, it's, it's interesting also that the Armenian identity to a large extent transcends national boundaries, as you can have someone who was not born in present day Armenia who does not speak Armenian like myself, um, and who does not regularly attend Armenian Apostolic Church, uh, considering him or herself or identifying him or herself as Armenian. And it's because of Armenia's vacillating status as a great power, a buffer state, and a subjugated and later persecuted people that the Armenian identity has developed under constant external pressure and thus looks inward. And given what Armenians have experienced recently and comments that We've all seen about Armenians noting that we now have to rely on ourselves because the Western world uh, doesn't necessarily have uh, the strategic in interest to intervene on our behalf. 
um, it seems that their Armenian identity is only going to be pushed further inward. Uh, as for the Azerbaijani identity, um, in contrast to the Armenian one, the Azerbaijani identity is more recent and it's more external, meaning it looks outwardly. Uh, the first references to Azerbaijani and Azeri, as Dr. Tatshian alluded, appeared uh, in the early 20th century upon the formation of the short-lived Republic of Azerbaijan in 1918. And the term Azerbaijan was borrowed um, from Iran from a state that existed in the first Persian empire. Uh, prior to the adoption of the term Azerbaijani, the ethnic population was referred to as the Caucasian Tatars or simply the Tatars. And Tatar is an umbrella term that's been used to refer to different peoples of ethnic uh, Turkish origin. Unlike the Armenians who had a distinct language and religion, the Azerbaijani identity, as I mentioned, looks outward. And so it looks to the Turks linguistically and ethnically. And it also looks to the Iranians religiously due to their shared Shia Muslim faith. This split, however, between the Turkic and the Persian worlds have made it difficult, difficult to develop a distinct Azerbaijani national uh, identity or ethnic consciousness. And another element that greatly influenced the Azerbaijani identity was this concept of Pan-Turkism in the early 20th century, which we know developed, due, um, developed in the declining Ottoman Empire and it espoused this idea of a great unified per Turkish state from the Balkans to Central Asia. And unfortunately for us Armenians, we happen to be the one big obstacle in the way. Likewise, after the Ottomans invaded Armenia in World War I to support Azerbaijani claims or Caucasian Tatar claims to Karabakh, um, we Armenians also began to equate the Azerbaijani Turks with the Ottoman and the Young Turk perpetrators of the um, Armenian pogroms in the late 19th century and the Armenian genocide of 1915. And again, I've seen many comments um, from both Armenians and Turks about Azerbaijanis being Turks. Um, and I think the recent Nagorno-Karabakh war for a lot of people uh, reminded them of shared history, shared experiences passed down from generations uh, dating back to, of course, the Armenian genocide. Um, but it's important to note that both the Armenian identities and the Azerbaijani identities, especially the latter, are fluid and they're evolving. Um, a few years ago, I was having dinner with a young woman from Azerbaijan, um, and I asked her what it is like to live in Baku, uh, the capital of Azerbaijan, as an ethnic minority. And the reason I asked that is because I knew that her uh, family is not Caucasian Tatar, but they're Yizgin. And the Yizgins are an ethnic group predominant in Dagestan, Russia, and Northeastern Azerbaijan. They have their own language, and they have their own remarkable and long history in the region. And this young woman looked at me, she's a family friend, and she looked at me straight in the eyes and she said, which translated from Russian means, I have pure Azerbaijani blood. So I dropped the subject. I'm still wrestling with the many interpretations of what that could mean, and I'll leave it to you all to contemplate it further. But it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting example of how the Azerbaijani identity and national consciousness is continuing to evolve. Um, for someone who of Yizgin uh, ethnic background to claim that she has pure Azerbaijani blood. Uh, I myself was born in Baku in the late 80s. Uh, and one thing that I've come to realize during this recent war is that many Armenians of my generation and certainly not those living in uh, the diaspora have ever met or come into contact with um, an Azerbaijani person and vice versa. And so when we're discussing these concepts of identity, of ethnicity, or even of territorial integrity, both Armenians and Azerbaijanis are missing certain tools in their toolbox uh, to both understand each other and to further our own uh, individual interests. Uh, and so this, this is why I believe we saw rallying cries such as Karabakh is Azerbaijan, and then the reply, Artsakh is Armenian. Even though the latter, the reply doesn't necessarily serve Armenians well because it frames the dispute between Armenia and Azerbaijan not as a fundamental question of self-determination, which is recognized and protected under international law, but as a border dispute, um, which plays into you know, Azerbaijan's arguments. Um, and likewise for Azerbaijanis, I remember seeing uh, a video in 2016 following you know, recent skirmishes then in Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, and it was a video of two men stopping on an Armenian flag in a subway car in Baku. 
to me, this photo, um, this video rather, had so much irony because my grandfather, uh, Nikolai Sumbatov, an Armenian, was the chief engineer of Baku and his central responsibility of his career was to design and build Baku's metro system, which then became the third largest in the Soviet Union. And after the Baku program, pogroms, there was such a campaign to erase any history of the Armenians' contributions to Azerbaijan, uh, which involved, of course, changing street names, changing the names of uh, Armenian architects or engineers to Azerbaijani architects and engineers, or simply noting that um, something was designed by a, quote, Western architect. When the Opera House, for example, we know was designed by um, not Western, but Armenian architects. Uh, and it's unfortunate because as a, uh, as a result of focusing on Armenians as an enemy, as a threat, and even by the lack of awareness about the many Armenian contributions to Azerbaijan, today's current Azerbaijanis are distracted from the true cause of their problems, which I believe is the Aliyev regime. Part of this, of course, has roots in the Soviet era. Um, if I had more time, I would get into how the Soviets played uh, what the Azerbaijanis felt was a game of favoritism. Um, and this is because by all accounts, Armenians, and I'm not saying this as a nationalist, but by all accounts, Armenians were more educated, whereas Caucasian Tatars um, were more agriculturally focused, which had the result of the Russians and then later the Soviets, um, but the Russians giving licenses for oil exploration, not to Caucasian Tatars, but to Armenians. Um, but even by fixating on this Caucasian Albanian historiography as their main argument, uh, which is a weak and easily discredited one, Azerbaijani scholars are following into the same framework created by the Soviets, which is an attempt to trace an ethnic group to some sort of ancient borders. Um, but those ancient borders, however, of course, also happen to be the more recently created Soviet borders. And in the process of operating within this Soviet framework, they're ignoring perhaps their actual and stronger roots or stronger claims to the region, which of course date back to the 11th century with the arrival of the Oz Turks from Central Asia. I think in the future, Azerbaijani discourse will start to shift away from this Indo-European, Caucasian, Albanian argument towards a more um, perhaps historically accurate uh, and stronger uh, Turkish argument. And I think we're already starting to see elements of that now. Uh, as to the Caucasian Albanians, it's, it is impossible today to figure out the contours of the Caucasian Albanians as an ethnicity. And this is because of course, we're looking at this concept of ethnicity from modern terms. Um, simply put, we just don't have the information to determine you know, who exactly the Caucasian Albanians were as an ethnicity. We have the writings um, from the first century of Strabo and Pliny. They both describe the Albanians. Strabo wrote that they were more inclined to a shepherd's life. They weren't ferocious. They were only moderately warlike. Um, he mentioned that there was at that point a single king ruling over all of the tribes, um, which previously had their own kings and had 26 separate languages. Uh, Pliny gave the geographic borders of the Albanians describing them uh, living at the banks of the Caspian Sea, which roughly corresponds to today's uh, Eastern Transcaucasia. But from all of these descriptions, it's unclear how Strabo and Pliny are demarcating the people that they mention, whether they're using social or ethnic parameters and how this latter concept of ethnicity corresponds to modern day thinking. So now, with all of that said, um, I'm going to focus the second part of my remarks on um, cultural erasure and why Azerbaijan's assumption of a Caucasian Albanian historiography will not save Artsakh's cultural monuments. Um, this is something that uh, a few people, particularly non-Armenians, have asked me. They said, well, isn't it good that Azerbaijan is claiming that these monuments are Caucasian Albanian because that'll mean that they'll want to protect them? Um, to which, of course, the response is, well, they claim the same thing in Nakichivan. Those 89 churches and thousands of uh, cross stone touch bars are destroyed. Um, and also, despite claiming that uh, these monuments in Nagorno-Karabakh are Caucasian Albanian, uh, Azerbaijan has never nominated any of them to the UNESCO World Heritage List, uh, while they have in fact nominated uh, a, a fortress, um, a natural stronghold in Shushi. And Armenia, for reasons you know, I, I can't get into, doesn't really have uh, the mechanisms under UNESCO to be able to nominate these cultural heritage sites. Um, 
whether UNESCO can actually protect cultural heritage sites in a time of peace, uh, the answer to that is not so positive. Uh, so moving along, um, if, if we could show for, uh, first the photo of the map of Artsakh's cultural sites. Thank you. So I didn't create this photo. Um, it looks like Vahe Mutartichian did. And I thank him for that because I found it on Google. I first saw it on social media and I thought it was very helpful. Um, so this demonstrates um, or illustrates Artsakh's 4,000 cultural sites. Now from these 4,000 sites, there are 370 Armenian churches. And many of them are in the Gal Bajar district, which was recently ceded to Azerbaijan from the November 10th ceasefire agreement. Uh, so what does the Caucasian Albanian claim mean for Artsakh's cultural heritage and why are many scholars fearing that these sites face cultural erasure? Well, for starters, it means that any elements of these sites that contain unique or distinctive Armenian elements that cannot be passed off as Caucasian Albanian will be removed. Uh, and if we can go to the uh, photo of uh, Ganzasar. So um, there's a photo of Ganzasar with it's, there it is, it's beautiful dome, it's uh, cupola. Uh, most Armenian cathedrals in the region, both in Nagorno-Karabakh and in um, the Republic of Armenia exhibit similar architectural features to those of uh, the mother church, uh, Ichmiadzin Cathedral in Armenia. Um, these architectural features include a cruciform plan topped by a rounded and pointed dome, um, what, what I refer to when I say the cupola. Uh, the cupola is one of the most recognized features of Armenian sacred spaces. Um, and if we could please go to photo three of the green chapel in Shushi, uh, we see already from Azerbaijani control of Shushi, photos of Azerbaijan's post ceasefire destruction of the Kanajam Armenian church, St. John the Baptist. Um, is this photo popping up, I hope? So, True to its revisionism, Azerbaijan claims without any basis that uh, this church in Shushi is not Armenian, but Russian Orthodox. And as a result, we've, um, oh, I can, it says pinch out for a bigger view. So it's just my iPad. Um, so as a result, we're seeing uh, erasure of distinctive Armenian elements, including the cross from the church and uh, its unique, you know, dome shape. Um, so the fourth photo I wanted to mention um, is a photo or focus on is a photo of Daddy Bank. And it shows um, the donor portrait, yes, and founding inscription of Daddy Bank, um, which is on many uh, areas uh, on the external surface of the church and also um, on the internal, uh, on the interior. So founding inscriptions and donor portraits are two other distinctive elements of Armenian cultural heritage. Um, donor portraits are particularly unique to Armenian churches in the region, the most notable of which were created in the 9th and 10th centuries by the Bagratuni dynasty. And they typically depict a model of the church in the hands of its donors, as you can see here in Dadi Bank. Um, as such, these inscriptions and donor portraits are one of the most problematic elements for Azerbaijan's claims that Armenian churches are actually Caucasian Albanian, because the inscriptions are engraved, of course, using the Armenian alphabet, and the donor portraits document and depict um, various Armenian nobles that commissioned the cathedrals and or gave land for the monastic sites. Uh, Azerbaijani revisionism posits, you know, with no basis that these inscriptions were either later added by the Armenians centuries later to hide the Caucasian Albanian provenance of these churches. Um, and they also claim that uh, the donor portraits uh, the donors were not actually Armenian princes, but somehow Caucasian Albanian princes. Um, so of course the fear is that Azerbaijan will erase, if not the donor portraits, but uh, the engravings and in the inscriptions in the Armenian language. And interestingly, a few days ago, the Azerbaijani Ministry of Defense released a video from Dadi Bank. And in this whole video uh, showing many beautiful angles and views of Dadi Bank, uh, the one telling uh, missing element of course, were Dadi Bank's uh, Armenian inscriptions and the donor portraits, which are prevalent both on the interior and the exterior walls of the church, as I mentioned. Um, at Ganzasar, um, which I don't have images of, but um, 
you can easily see if you uh, even Google Gansasar, the donation inscriptions are engraved within the interior of the church um, in its most sacred spaces. Uh, and on the north wall, there's an inscription that describes Prince Hassan Jalal Dalwa's wish to commission the Gansasar Monastery, uh, the construction of which began in 1216 and lasted until 12, uh, 1238. Um, there is a donor portrait on the exterior of the church. Um, actually, you might be able to see this in, in the very first photo that I provided, but uh, not to jump around too much in, in terms of the photos. There's an exterior um, donor portrait on the dome that depicts Prince Hassan Jalal sitting cross-legged uh, with a model of the church, holding a model of the church. And this is a device that's meant to project power at the Seljuk court. And despite adopting an, uh, an Arab influence name, which was fashionable at the time, Princess Al Jala Prince Hassan Jalal, um, who was a grand prince of, yes, you can see it there. He's sitting cross-legged and he's um, holding, holding the model of the church. Um, so he was described um, by his contemporaries as Armenian. Uh, quote, Hassan, the great prince of the Hashen and Artsakh region, whom they endearingly called Jalal, a pious religious man and a modest Armenian by nationality. So this is what's documented by contemporaneous historians uh, who were discussing Hassan Jalal at the time that he lived or shortly afterward. Of course, Azerbaijani revisionists, um, such as Bunyadov and Mamadova, however, claimed that Prince Hassan Jalal was not Armenian, but was Caucasian Albanian. Um, the third element that is likely to face cultural erasure um, is, of course, the Hachkars. If we could please go to photo five of Ochte Durni. So, um, as many Armenians know, and even non Armenians, the cross, which represents um, crucifixion and salvation, is an important part of um, worship for Armenian Christians and our meditative and devotional practice. Uh, Armenians create hachkars, which are intricately carved Armenian cross stones that contain a cross in the middle, um, often resting on a symbol of a sun or some other type of eternity symbol. And hachkars are on UNESCO's representative list of the intangible heritage of humanity. If you've been to Armenia, if you've been to Nagorno-Karabakh Artsakh, you'll see that they're dotted um, all over the landscape. You'll find them along roads at the top of mountains, and of course, in churches and cemeteries. Um, often covered in melted wax from you know, candles lit by praying Christians. Um, I wanted to show a photo not of Dadi, uh, Dadivank's Hachkars, which Dadivank has beautiful Hachkars. A lot of photos of them have been circulating, especially after the ceasefire, um, but of a small cross stone from uh, Ochta Durni. Uh, this was a church which was likely built in the seventh century and it's located in Hadrut, um, which is one of the regions that is being uh, ceded to Azerbaijan. Um, th this church is hard to reach. Uh, I, I had a hike up here with my dad and then we later found that there was a much easier trail up the mountain. Um, but what's notable here is that the Hachkar is really the only surviving element that shows us the true nature of the structure, which was as a church. Um, and so given that, um, of course, of course, this church isn't in the best condition now, but I think the final step in terms of its erasure would be to remove the Hachgar. Um, so I don't really have concluding remarks. I, I know that I gave a lot of um, information, perhaps even an information overload, um, but it's interesting to think about how these claims of Caucasian Albanian heritage or historiography uh, don't necessarily help us in terms of preserving these cultural heritage sites in Artsakh. Thank you so much, Yelena. That was really great. So much information uh, for the archive, very important. And I actually want to apologize. There was an issue showing Ganat Jam. So if you don't mind, I'm going to share it again. Uh, and maybe you can say one sentence about it. I think it's very important uh, for people to see this. So uh, just one second. I hope this time it will work. Oh, excellent. There um, we go, <laughs> yeah. So uh, on the left side is a before photo and on the right side is an after photo. And you'll see that there are some windows that are circled 
Uh, the reason why is because once the after photo began circulating on social media, showing that um, the dome and the tower and the cross had been removed, of course, um, different people, likely Azerbaijani or Turkish, were saying that this is fake news, this is black propaganda, we didn't do this. And so someone then went ahead and um, uploaded this photo showing why the before photo and the after photo depict the same structure. Um, and again, it's the cupola, the uh, rounded pointed dome that we all are so familiar with as, an, as a distinct you know, architectural feature of Armenian churches that was erased here. Thank you so much for that uh, and for your presentation. Um, so we will have some questions which we've uh, which I'll be asking you at the end, uh, and you can elaborate even more there. So now I would like to introduce our final speaker, Dr. Mashinka Firunz Hagopian. And uh, Mashinka Firunz Hagopian is senior researcher at the Bergrun, Bergrun Institute, associate editor at Noema, and contributing editor at the Los Angeles Review of Books. Prior to joining the Institute, she held a two year teaching appointment in the Department of English at UCLA. She received her PhD in History of Art from the University of Pennsylvania in 2018. And her book, Algorithmic Bias Training, Lectures for Intelligent Machines is forthcoming from X Artist Book in 2021. So Mashinka, thank you so much for joining us. We're really excited to hear your comments. Thank you so much, Lore, uh, and to Zoravik for organizing this. Um, I'm grateful to be speaking alongside Vahe and Yelena, and grateful to be participating in this conversation at what I think is a really crucial moment for the preservation of Artsakh's cultural heritage. Um, I want to begin my presentation with a kind of epigraph, uh, with a poetic text that I wrote a couple of years ago about the Mashal Charantir. Um, so the Mushu Charantid is a 13th century Armenian illuminated manuscript weighing approximately 60 pounds, roughly twice the weight of a gold bar. And here I'll screen share and start the slideshow. The book was discovered by two Armenian women on the territory of the Ottoman Empire in 1915 amid Turkey's genocidal campaign against the Armenian people. The women had reason to believe the manuscript would be destroyed, but neither of them was able to carry it alone because of its tremendous weight. So they divided it into two parts and each transported half of the manuscript 60 pounds. Traveling the distance between the Mush province over the border of Georgia, they were said to have carried the book on their backs. The two halves of the manuscript were eventually reunited and are now on display at the Matenadaran Institute of Ancient Manuscripts in Yerevan, where it is identified as Armenia's largest book. I heard the story of the Mashal Charantid as a child, a story about how bodies, and particularly feminized bodies, are asked to carry archives across great distances and great territories, weighted down by many kilograms of collective memory work in order to bring our histories into the present. I've been returning to this story often in recent weeks as we've watched developments unfold after the signing of the trilateral agreement that enabled Azerbaijan's seizure of ancestral lands in Artsakh. When I first heard the story of the Mushal Charantid as a child, it seemed unintelligible. I puzzled at why two people fleeing a genocidal campaign would go to such pains to preserve a cultural artifact. A narrative that was incomprehensible at the time would eventually lay the foundation for why I became an art historian and ultimately why I am speaking to you now. Because for displaced, dispossessed, and diasporic peoples, cultural artifacts are never mere ornament. They're interventions in a political field. For the displaced and dispossessed, ancient cultural output provides material evidence for the historical existence of a people in a region. And just as present cultural output attests to their continued existence, despite efforts toward their annihilation. Cultural artifacts can disrupt the ethno-territorial claims and nation building of neo-colonial regimes by making their own claims for the existence of indigenous life and life worlds. As I said, I've been returning to the story of the Mushal Charantid in recent weeks, as the Armenians of Karbachar prepared to leave their ancestral lands and removed bells, crosses, and khachkars from Dadivank Monastery to safeguard them. 
And along with those key cultural artifacts, some residents of Karbachar have also decided to transport the graves of their ancestors. Beyond Dadivank, occupied Artsakh hosts indigenous Armenian sites that we've already heard about, like Tigranagert, the first century BCE Hellenistic Armenian city and archaeological site, Katichavank, the 13th century monastery, and Titernavank, which dates to the 5th or 6th century. We've learned recently that concerns about the fate of Artsakh's cultural monuments uh, were not unfounded. They've been confirmed by the Atlantic Council's Digital Forensic Research Lab. And on November 24th, the lab verified and published visual evidence of the desecration of Armenian churches and monuments in recently occupied territories of Artsakh. They documented graffiti and vandalism to Gazan Chetzot's Cathedral in Shushi, the toppling of a cross on an Armenian chapel in the town of uh, Mehakaban, and the desecration of a monument in Kubatli to Armenian soldiers fallen in the first Artsakh Liberation War. We know that a systemic policy of cultural genocide enacted by the Azerbaijani regime has a long history. Last year, researchers Simon Marakian and Sarah Pickman published a forensic report in Hyperallergic on the cultural cleansing of indigenous Armenian output in the exclave of Nakhicheban. The report documented Azerbaijan's destruction of 89 medieval Armenian churches, 5,840 cross stones, and 22,000 tombstones in the region that once held a sprawling Armenian necropolis and the largest Armenian cemetery in the world. Azerbaijan's response was remarkable. As Mahakian and Pikmin note, according to Azerbaijani officials, reported destruction was a farce. The site had not been disturbed because it never existed in the first place. Despite ample testimony to the contrary, Azerbaijan claims that Nakhichevan was never Armenian. In an address to the nation this month, uh, President Ilham Aliyev, uh, noted kleptocrat and oligarch, petro-oligarch, reiterated Azerbaijan's ethno-territorial claims in a stentorian boom. He announced, Kalbajar is our ancient land. It is the land of ancient Azerbaijan. And went on to say that many historical documents confirm this. Armenian historians and imposters have simply Armenianized the ancient Albanian churches, added their own inscriptions and appropriated them. In actual fact, as figures like Thomas DeWall have noted, and this is of course not to endorse DeWall's work in its entirety, uh, nobody believes the Caucasian Albanian theory outside of Azerbaijan. Similarly, Igor Dorfman Lazarev, a lecturer in France, has written that the myth about Caucasian Albania as the direct ancestor of the Turkic speaking Azerbaijan appeared and was propelled to prove that the Albanian past of Azerbaijan has no Armenian traces in it. But I would add, and I think that it's crucial to emphasize that Armenian monuments don't primarily threaten Azerbaijan's manufactured fictive past. They also undermine the legitimacy of its present and future. In a lecture titled, What Do Monuments Want? Art historian and visual studies scholar W.J.T. Mitchell suggests that monuments want to live forever. They want to defeat history. They want to be alive in the present. Put otherwise, monuments materialize the past as present. And in the possibility of their material permanence, they represent the prospect of carrying the past into the future. What we have then is a scenario where the indigenous past of Armenian monuments disrupts the settler futurity that the occupying forces hope to build. As we know, and as has been discussed already, Armenians have been indigenous to what is now the Democratic Republic of Artsakh for millennia. Greek historian Strabo affirms the presence of Armenian speaking peoples in Artsakh in the second century BC. Today, settler colonial logic suffuses the statements issued by Azerbaijan and Turkey's autocratic rulers. Uh, Aliyev has boasted, this is the end, we are chasing them like dogs, Nagorno-Karabakh is our land. In fact, as has also been noted, Artsakh was stolen land gifted to Azerbaijan by Stalin during the region's Sovietization. And at the time, its population was over 90% Armenian when it was absorbed into the Soviet's colonial cartographies and dispossessed of the right to self-governance. And moreover, a policy of Azerbaijani settlement was pursued in the effort to dilute the Armenian majority and to fortify a settler colonial campaign through indigenous erasure. We also know that settler colonial sentiments have been uh, at play for a very long time. Uh, in 2005, Bakumer told the visiting delegation from Germany, 
Our goal is the complete elimination of Armenians. You Nazis already eliminated the Jews in the 1930s and 40s. You should be able to understand us. That mayor was, of course, subsequently appointed to the post of deputy prime minister. So what resounds in these words, if not the familiar coupling of settler sovereignty with genocidal sentiment? Indigenous monuments call forth a past that's incompatible with settler historical revisionism and Azerbaijani ethno-territorial nation building. But we aren't working to preserve cultural artifacts simply because they serve as remnants of a distant past. Indigenous Armenian monuments materialize a decolonial gesture. They hold out the possibility of futures where indigenous life and life worlds continue to endure. And I'll stop my remarks there in the interest of time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mashinka. That was fantastic. Uh, so as I expected, uh, I'm very happy with all of your comments. So thank you. And now it's time for our Q&A. And we do have some predetermined uh, questions that we, we chose in consultation with you. So I would like to begin with um, a question for Vahe. And it's the following. If the Caucasian Albanian legacy is so important in Artsakh Armenian culture, if Armenians and Caucasians, Caucasian Albanians coexisted from time immemorial in this region, how can one explain the Azerbaijani insistence of maintaining their ethnogenetic theory and how and why um, do you know, they consider the Azerbaijanis as the legitimate and only or sole inheritors of that legacy? Um, I hope that question came through, but I think you, you know what it is because we <laughs> formulated it together. So I'll let you answer if you un unmute yourself, please. Unmute. Um, I th you're still muted, Vahe. Can't hear you. No. There we go. Yeah. No, you muted it again. <laughs> Heard you very briefly, but then it disappeared. No. No. The little red microphone needs to disappear. There no. we go. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So uh, I think we have here an issue uh, related to a historical and cultural legacy that Azerbaijan is trying to portray or to define by nationalist tools. I mean, using the modernist concepts of a nation, adding to that violent and uh, I will say radicalistic views that are characteristic to dictatorial regimes. I mean, instead of saying that the region of Artsakh is rich with many cultures and among others, mainly the Armenian culture, they are simply erasing the Armenian name and replacing it with the Caucasian Albanians. And this is something very characteristic to historians who are simply creating or inventing uh, ethnogenetic theories. Uh, I think it is also time that Armenians start to study better uh, the Caucasian Albanian legacy in their own culture, mainly in Artsakh and Sunik. Uh, you know, uh, there are no pure nations. Huh? Every nation is a fascinating accumulation of different cultures, a diversity of cultural, ethnic, religious legacies. And the Armenians are not an exception in this case. Uh, when you study the history of Armenians in the regions of, uh, I will say, uh, some areas that I know better, Harpert, Urfa, Diyarbekir, uh, you will see that they coexisted with local, mainly Christian cultures. And uh, the, the most important of them was the Syriac culture. Uh, and of course, there was also the, the Muslim culture, but here I'm insisting on the Syriacs because we know that the Armenians in these regions, uh, Diyarbekir, Urfa, Harpert, uh, they supplanted culturally and demographically the, the local Syriacs. However, local Armenians continue to maintain many uh, features of the precedent cultures in their daily life, in festivals, in language, in architecture, religious customs, and so on. So it is time to study the history and cultural legacy of Artsakh in this context too. Uh, in my opinion, it will be enriching 
uh, it's the history of two ethnic populations, Armenians and Caucasian Albanians that coexisted in the region of Sunnic and Artsakh from antiquity, shared many values. And it's not even important to enter in this, uh, I will say, a futile game consisting to find which group was the newcomer in the region. But the most important is to accept that legacy. And such studies will also be a very good reply to all dictatorial attempts to deform the history and the memory of the region. Thank you, Vahe. Thank you. Uh, and at the end of this uh, panel, we do have a list of sources and uh, further readings. So if you're curious about the topic, we will uh, share those with you and you can explore further. Uh, so here's the next question, which is for Yelena. And uh, we actually have time to do both. So I think I'll start with um, the following. To what extent are our concerns for Armenian cultural heritage residing in the territories recently ceded to Azerbaijan allayed by the presence of Russian peacekeepers? And Yelena, if you're inclined, you can connect it to your other question or I can ask that one separately, up to you. Okay, great. Um, so before I get into the question, I, I just wanna mention uh, when I first started researching uh, Caucasian Albanian historiography several years ago, I actually called my mother and asked her, are we Caucasian Albanian? Because this was the first time I had seen this term. I kept seeing it over and over again. And my family historically is from Artsakh, from uh, Martini and from Shushi. Uh, so I'll be the first person uh, to say um, that I agree with you, Vahe, that we need to look at our own history a, a little bit more critically and not to paint it in a brush of everything is Armenian. You know, Armenians were the first people ever. Uh, we are definitely an early people. Um, and in the process, we can discover uh, a rich history and, and many interesting things about ourselves that we may not have realized. Um, so that brings us to um, the status of the culture today and whether the presence of Russian peacekeepers will be able to protect Armenian, Caucasian Albanian, whatever you want to call it, Armenia's, Armenia sized Caucasian Albanian heritage. Um, as I mentioned, there are, are over 370 churches in uh, Artsakh, um, and many of them are in the Galbajar province, which has been ceded to Azerbaijan, including Dadivak and Gondasor. I believe that there is no way that all of these uh, churches, monasteries, monuments can be protected. And this is why. Um, it's so important for, important for us to raise this issue in terms of international awareness, um, not just now, but in the future to keep the pressure on Azerbaijan. Um, regardless of whether or not elements of these monasteries are intentionally or um, completely destroyed, uh, I think it's important to recall or keep in mind that many of these monasteries, as I showed with Ukta Dorni, are already in uh, a poor condition. Uh, and this is largely because uh, they've suffered, we have to keep in mind, from the Soviet Union's nationalizing policies, meaning for over 100 years, these centuries, if not millennia old monasteries, millennium old monasteries, um, had zero, a complete absence of any sort of maintenance. Um, and so given that, it's remarkable that so many of these monasteries still survive today. I think it's positive that there are Russian peacekeepers, um, but keep, uh, keep in mind, uh, Azerbaijan recently released a video uh, from the Ministry of Defense, as I mentioned, from Dadivank. And this was um, a few days after everyone was saying, oh, Dadivank is being protected by Russian peacekeepers. And maybe part of that was to reassert uh, their control in the region. Um, but regardless of whether or not we have Russian peacekeepers, I don't, I don't think that all of these sites can be protected. Thank you, Yelena. Uh, it's a sad reality, but um, thank you. And that is also one reason why we're having events like this to actually document this uh, situation, this process. And um, I do believe that we are actually part of the archive. So I think it's very important to have events um, and cultural production on this topic um, because it is part of a sort of resistance at least. So mm -hmm. um, now my, Third question is, let's see. 
Um, Mashinka, can you discuss the response of art historians and arts institutions to the dangers posed to Armenia's cultural heritage in occupied Artsakh? I think um, it's, it's been interesting to see what the response on the part of the global community has been. And on the part of arts institutions in particular, there's been a pretty concerted outcries. So the Met issued, uh, the Met, which of course had done the um, Armenia exhibition just a few years back, issued a statement um, suggesting that the loss of cultural heritage sites in Artsakh would be a theft from future generations, which was very welcome. Um, the Getty suggested that deliberate physical attacks on cultural heritage are also uh, figurative assaults on the people who identify with that heritage. So their statement created a link between um, cultural genocide and the massacre of, of peoples. Um, unfortunately, in order to make a real and palpable material intervention and to actually take steps toward preservation, um, what we will need is more, more than simply statements. We will need a very robust coalition building with agencies that can uh, take the steps necessary and have the resources necessary to really institute um, robust protections and monitoring systems. And given, given UNESCO's actions to date, it's very, it's very concerning and uh, seems somewhat unlikely that that will be the case at this juncture unless we amplify the visibility of the crisis and continue to do that as much as possible. Yes, thank you, Mashinka. And actually, this reminds me, uh, I'm forgetting the name, but it might be worth me finding it, actually. Um, Simon Mahakian, who authored, co-authored the report with uh, Sarah Pickman on um, on Nachichevan and the cultural erasure there had noted how someone, I need to find this, who had been, who has now been promoted to another key role was the very person who blocked the sort of tracking of the cultural erasure happening in Nachichevan previously. So let me just find that. I think it's important for our audience to hear. Are you, uh, are you um, referring to the anecdote um, about how early on when, um, I forget the name of the photographer who they are working with, something like Agram Maivazi on something like this, that he goes to, he goes to Nachichevan and he's interrupted and given coffee by a soldier there. And the soldier turns out to be Ilham Aliyev's father later on. That's, yeah. Wow, no, I had not heard that one, uh, but that's really interesting. And I actually, in the meantime, also found this source I want to mention. So one should connect all of these together. Uh, Simon Mahakian writes, in 2010, when Andrea Huber, current head of human rights department at OSCE Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, uh, worked at Amnesty International Secretariat, and prevented Amnesty International USA from exposing Azerbaijan's erasure of Julfa, the world's largest medieval Armenian cemetery. Um, and this is why the AAAS started releasing sal satellite studies on its own. And so I just wanted to, to bring that up as an example of, um, you know, we hope and expect people with power who work at institutions and organizations organizations uh, who, you know, ostensibly <laughs> um, should help. We, we hope that they will, but sadly, um, there's quite a, a, a history of them not doing uh, that job. Well, we're also seeing, um, if I may chime in here, we're also oh, seeing the result of uh, the United States withdrawing its support from numerous intergovernmental organizations and bodies. Um, notably, when the US pulled its funding from UNESCO, uh, guess which country among, you know, many others stepped in, uh, Azerbaijan. Um, I don't mean to say that necessarily mandates that UNESCO is going to have a conflict of interest, um, but I think it's telling that we Armenians often rely on the strength of our history, the strength of our cultural heritage, and think we can just rest at that. And we don't necessarily do what Azerbaijan and Turkey have been doing, which is building coalitions, um, getting their narrative out there, um, and providing resources to uh, numerous intergovernmental organizations uh, and nonprofits that really do need the monetary support. You're absolutely right. Um, 
And, and that is something I think Armenians need to work on. And I can't help, I, my research topic subject is actually related to France and uh, I work also on the end of the French colonial empire. And I can't help but think about the debates that are happening about um, restitution of um, stolen um, art and artifacts from sub-Saharan African former colonies. And I really, I, I really think it would be worth doing uh, an event or a paper kind of comparing this museumification of history of these objects that it seems, you know, they actually, as Mashinka said, they have so much more power to them and locking them up in these museums and giving them pretty little shows um, is actually dulling their, in, in, in some ways, if more is not done with them, actually dulls their kind of power, if that makes any sense. I mean, it's a really like the first thought, but I, I think there is something we can think about there in terms of um, destroyed or stolen artifacts, et cetera. Okay, next okay. question. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Briefly add to what Yelena said. I, I think, Yelena, that you're absolutely right to point to um, what could very well be very serious conflicts of interest within UNESCO. And in Simone Mohakian's recent um, October essay, he points out that um, Secretary General Irina Bakova uh, has been accused very widely of conflicts of interest. Um, and not only related to the fact that Azerbaijan made a gift of millions of dollars to UNESCO, but to the fact that her husband consulted husband. for an Azeri company, um, mm -hmm. after which she uh, set up the exhibition Azerbaijan, a land of tolerance at the UNESCO headquarters, um, mm -hmm. and the Heydar Aliyev Foundation organized the event. So I think that there, there is every bit of material evidence and reason to be quite um, suspicious and circumspect about the role that UNESCO has been playing and is playing today. The Guardian has a great article on the Azerbaijani laundromat scheme um, from three years ago and some of what she mentioned is in that article. Excellent, thank you both for sharing these very important um, details and contextual bits of information. All right, so now let's see. Um, we're doing very well on time, I'm very happy. <laughs> um, so let's, uh, Yelena, I think this is a, an, an interesting question which which you came up with and which we do want to address. So we have seen Azerbaijanis claim that Armenians intentionally neglect certain Caucasian Albanian cathedrals. The images of um, Gutchavank with so-called graffiti come to mind. Uh, and I'm about to show you that image. Um, and to what extent are these claims accurate? And I'll, shall I share my screen? Okay. Yes, please. Uh, let's um, see. So this was something that I was seeing uh, during the war, the invasion, the ethnic cleansing, whatever you want to um, call it, <laughs> which are these, this is this is my own photo, but um, these photos of Getchevank with um, the so-called graffiti. Uh, and a lot of them were on Twitter and people, uh, you know, either from Turkey or from Azerbaijan were tweeting to UNESCO uh, look what the Armenians are doing to uh, damage Caucasian Albanian heritage. Um, <laughs> so, as I mentioned, um, many of these monasteries uh, fell victim to the Soviet Union's nationalizing policies. Um, and when you, well, now I can't say, well, when you go to Getchevank, uh, but if you had the opportunity to visit Getchevank, uh, you would see that a lot of this. Um, graffiti or these names are written not in Armenian, but they're written in Russian, uh, even though many of them are Russian names. Uh, and they also have dates. They have dates that are in the uh, 1960s and the 1970s. Um, what's interesting about that um, in, in terms of the idea of this graffiti is that uh, inscribing your name actually is a sacred practice, uh, a sacred and ancient pilgrimage practice practice which dates back to the fourth century. And it's a strong example of contemporary private devotion in the region, you know, transforming, um, an, transforming an object into a vehicle for devotional purposes. Uh, it's an intimate act. Uh, so <laughs> even though that, even though, you know, to an outside observer, it looks like graffiti, what really struck me was that Getchevank is not a um, consecrated church. It hasn't been in a while when I visited it was undergoing um, restoration. Um, but the other thing that I would, that I noticed when I was at Getchevank besides the graffiti 
which I admit the, fir the first time you see it really is sort of hits you and, and you think, oh my gosh, how, how could this um, cathedral be in, in such a state? Um, but what you'll also notice while you spend time in Getchebank is there is a lot of uh, candle wax and matchboxes, which if you don't mind showing the second photo. So the second photo that you'll see in a moment um, Just one second. Uh, no worries. I, I, so I can describe it. Um, okay. It's a photo of the altar, and there's just a huge amount of candle wax and many, many, many matches. And similar to the Hachkars, um, similar to the destroyed, ruined churches and monasteries, including uh, Okhtar Turni, which you know has not been undergoing any uh, significant uh, restoration or no restoration. Um, you'll see a lot of uh, traces that people in the region, Armenians in the region, are still using these sites uh, for devotional purposes. And so the combination of the so-called graffiti, uh, which I would refer to rather as the practice of inscribing one's name with um, candles, with these matchboxes, with these wax, leads to uh, what, what I believe is the true fact that not it's not that the Armenians have been um, graffitiing over Getchevank in order to neglect Caucasian Albanian heritage, but Getchevank is not a consecrated church. Um, and as such, Armenians are continuing despite that to use it as part of their uh, meditative and uh, devotional practices. Um, and another thing I would note briefly because I, a lot of this discussion has been rightly uh, cynical or negative, um, is that this isn't the first time that many of these uh, Armenian monasteries, cathedrals have been uh, desecrated. Amaras, for example, uh, one of the earliest churches in the region uh, and monastic complex, was the first Armenian language school from the early fifth century. Uh, it was plundered in the 13th century by the Mongols. In 1387, it was desecrated during the campaigns of the Sword of Islam, Tamerlan. And then it was demolished again in the 16th century. It was then rebuilt in the 17th century with fortified walls. Then it was abandoned. Then it was used by Russian Imperial troops as a frontier fortress. And then it was rebuilt and its church reconsecrated in 1858 with funds from the Armenians uh, of Shushi. And soon after that, its monastic grounds became a collective farm in the Soviet period. I say that um, just to put into context that this is not the first time that these monuments have faced um, destruction and cultural erasure, even though of course with their being exclusively in Azerbaijani control and the threat that these monuments in their Armenian history pose to Azerbaijani claims to the region, of course means that they're at greater risk of destruction. Uh, but I just wanted to note that in, in context, in terms of the region's 2000 plus year Armenian history, this is not the first time that these monasteries face such destruction and have been able to survive. Fascinating. I really did not know that about Amaras. And mm -hmm. I think it's actually good for all of us to learn more about our, our history and the history of these monuments, places, cities. Um, also, because it will give us some more perspective on the present, however, um, however, you know, grim, grim it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so again, we're doing well on time. So I just wanted to tell you speakers, do you have any questions for each other before I get to our last two questions? Or do you have any additional comments that have come up organically? So I have a question actually, um, for someone who's, uh, this is for uh, Vahe, for someone who's interested in researching Caucasian Albanian historiography, um, as I you know, myself have done. It's not an easy task. Um, what are, and if you go to online sources, you're only going to be confused. At one point, you'll think that Caucasian Albanians are um, the predecessors to the Udi people. At another point, you'll think that they're predecessors of Azerbaijanis and Armenians, which I think both of those elements are true. Um, so someone who's interested in doing research about uh, Caucasian Albanian historiography, where, where would you point them um, to be able to do that sort of research on their own? I mean, one of the best source on the history of the 
old history of the of, of the Caucasian Albanians is is an Armenian book. Yeah, as, as I said in my presentation, is Garan uh, Kadvati's books that you can find also a translation in English. It was translated by Charles Donset in uh, 1960s, mm -hmm. I mean, or 1950s. I, I don't remember. Uh, so it's a it's a very good source. I I, I was reading at this occasion this book. I, I read it during my student times by I reread it now and it's a fascinating book that you can find so many information about the culture about the relations with the Armenians about this uh, sharing values uh, between Armenians and Caucasian Albanians about the place of Amaras that uh, you, 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 you presented in your in, in your talk that uh, it was also a sacred place for the Caucasian Ar uh, uh, Albanians uh, Amaras it was there where uh, Krikor is one of uh, uh, the, 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 the Catholic uh, of the Caucasian Albanians. Yes, the, right? yes, who was also the, not the son, but the grandson uh, of uh, the grandson Saint of Saint Gregory uh, the Illuminator. Of, yes. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, so he he was uh, his tomb is there. So uh, everything is fascinating in this book. It's it's it's, it's uh, uh, this is one of the books that I will recommend you and. Uh, uh, the other sources uh, I was reading today, the article of Stefan Asturian, which, uh, which is also a fascinating article. Uh, this is uh, about the ethnogenesis uh, of uh, uh, Azerbaijan uh, ethnogenesis. And there you can also find some very good uh, Armenian uh, references, uh, which were published during that discussion, uh, who were the Caucasian Albanians, uh, uh, that happened in the 1960s, 70s, 80s. So the, that, that was the Armenian reaction to that, uh, uh, to that discussion. And uh, these books were published in Yerevan. Uh, and I think that uh, they are also available online. Thank you. Thank you to both of you. Any other questions? Follow up question uh, for Vahe. I was really struck in your presentation about your your discussion of uh, the coexistence between Caucasian Albanians and Armenians in the region before before the Caucasian Albanians were Armenianized. And um, I think that one of the one of the pitfalls of making claims for Armenian indigeneity can often be that those claims are framed in a sort of ethno territorial ethno nationalist way that precludes. Um, cohabitation or precludes what um, scholars like Nelly Sarkisian have called communi uh, cultivating communal forms of multi-ethnic living. And so I, I would be very curious um, and grateful to hear you talk a bit more about what, what possibilities there might be for turning to this moment, this earlier historical moment of coexistence and thinking through possibilities for cohabitation in the present through that historical moment. I think from the point of view of Armenian historiography, one of the main obstacles uh, is uh, to erase that or to, uh, to study history without uh, the, I mean, the concept uh, to assess or to confirm that who was, who was the, the first in, uh, in that territories, the Armenians or the Caucasian or Albanians. Uh, when, when you erase that obstacle, I think that there are so a, a big space for to study the, the relations between Caucasian Albanians and Armenians in this territory. Uh, their shared values, their shared history, their shared uh, uh, enemies. Uh, and uh, so it's, in my opinion, it's a fascinating uh, history. And uh, the few, this few days that I, I was reading uh, a couple of books about that story, I, I learned so much things. And uh, that, uh, and the thing that struck me the, the most is that uh, until now there are uh, very few uh, uh, important studies on this subject. And uh, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, even if you read the history of the Albanians by Moses Vasporanci, uh, who wrote in the 10th century, in the chronicles there's this wonderful. Um, explanation of how the Armenian uh, nobility and how the Caucasian Albanian nobility, noble families often allied with one another, um, meaning they would come together often through intermarriage to fight the Arabs. Mm -hmm. And um, by the end of the 10th century, there was no longer this distinction so much between the Armenian and the Caucasian Albanian inhabitants of New Albania, 
because by the end of these chronicles, the Prince of Albania was referred to as Abu Ali, quote, Abu Ali, the native Armenian, the brother of Armenian King Sumbat. So there's a rich, you know, history um, and a history of mutual interests and cooperation between the Armenian and the Caucasian Albanian no noble families, which I was really struck by when I first started to research Caucasian Albanian historiography. Mm. And another important sequence, which is also very interesting uh, in the relations between Caucasian Albanians and Armenians is, is, the, is the name of the Catholicos. Eh? It was the official name of the Catholicos of uh, Caucasian Albanians was, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's the official name was Caucasian Albanian Catholicos, which remained the same even after the Armenization uh, uh, period. So uh, mm -hmm. the first, the seat uh, during the kingdom was in uh, Parta, Barta, uh, in present day Azerbaijan. But then later when uh, the Christianization happened, uh, uh, or let's say the mus uh, Islamization of the rest of the uh, Azerbaijan uh, took place in uh, starting seventh, seventh century. And the, the elite uh, who continued or was very likely regrouped in Artsakh. Uh, they refounded or resettled the, the Catholic Cossack in Kansasar, as, as, as you know. Uh, Kansasar became the, the, the seat of the, of the Catholic Cossack of uh, Caucasian Albanians. But uh, so this is the period of Armenization. Uh, even after the Armenization process, the official name of uh, the Catholic Cossack remained uh, the Catholic Cossack of uh, Caucasian Albanian. And this is again a very interesting sequence in this relation between Armenians and Caucasian Albanians. And uh, why this name remained, in my opinion, it's very typi uh, the typical Armenian uh, answer. Uh, in my opinion, uh, there are, of course, you know, uh, there are times in history when uh, Armenians did have more than uh, one Catholic uh, uh, in their history. Uh, there were Echmiadzin, uh, Ani, Akhtamar, Ahvank in this case, so the Caucasian Albanian Catholic Cossack, which was an Armenian Catholic Cossack uh, 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 starting 13th century, and Cilicia. Huh? And uh, this is again a very interesting sequence because every prince, every ruler uh, needed uh, a spiritual uh, power uh, in, in order to reinforce its political and uh, spiritual uh, power in, in the region. And sometimes uh, to avoid centralization efforts by other rival Armenian kings and princes. Uh, this, is, this is why this uh, uh, name remained, uh, uh, official name of, uh, of the Catholic mm -hmm. had remained uh, in Kansasar. And it was a reminiscent of these medieval times, the same way as the Catholic Cossack of Akhtamar, uh, which, which is uh, a Catholic Cossack that uh, uh, conserved until the end of 19th century, or the Catholic Cossack of Cilicia, which is which exists un, uh, until today. Huh? And so this is again a very Armenian uh, answer. Uh. Thank you, Vahe. Um, I wanted to add, uh, in terms of other um, scholars, um, the I have been told that the best scholar uh, alive in Armenia is Dr. Alexan Hakobian. And uh, also that Dr. George Burnutian has done work on the region in the Russian imperial period. So if anyone is curious for further reading, in addition to the sources um, I'll share at the end of the program, you can uh, look into their work. Um, any other questions for each other before I ask our final question? Now is your chance. <laughs> okay, so final question. Um, is for Mashinka. What have been some of the notable initiatives or projects to preserve Artsakh's cultural heritage? Um, there's one really remarkable project that relates to uh, Nakhi Jalan, actually. Um, so not, not quite responding to your question, but um, it's a uh, Julfa Cemetery Digital Repatriation Project that was done by Judith Crispin at the um, Australian Catholic University and used 3D imaging technology um, to recreate the necropolis that was lost. And uh, the project's stated mission is to demonstrate 
to those who would destroy world heritage that their efforts are in vain. This is how they put it. Um, and so I think that one of the things that we will have to do moving forward in addition to being extremely vigilant about our advocacy for the preservation of cultural heritage is also to be tactical and inventive in bringing back what we have lost and in thinking about ways to um, reanimate in the present those things that uh, otherwise would be um, lost, lost to time. Thank you, Mashinka. Um, I had not heard of that project, so I'm really glad that you mentioned it. And again, I conceive this event as a sort of archival object, so with a bunch of resources, so I hope that's how it will be used. Um, I actually do have one more question, uh, which came from an audience member, um, like a VIP audience member who gets to ask a question. <laughs> Um, so we've been hearing stories of cultural artifacts that are being removed from their place of origin in order to protect them from destruction, right? Things like bells and manuscripts. I, I believe it was with Dadi Vank that they had removed the bells, but then may have uh, changed course, at least with some elements once they found out about, about, about the Russian peacekeepers. I can't quite remember. However, when preserved in museum settings, and okay, this person is echoing uh, what we brought up earlier, these objects lose their religious and historical power. Mm -hmm. One might even add the word spiritual power, right? Mm -hmm. um, and cultural, I would say. Uh, do you know of any museum practices or digital initiatives uh, in Armenian contexts and otherwise that place the objects and don't diminish their power? Is this for the art historian? I don't want to make assumptions. <laughs> I have a feeling it's for you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I think that it's absolutely valid to be concerned about the loss of cultural specificity and the loss of contextual specificity in the act of removal and uh, resituating works in, in new spaces. Um, but I think that like the history of Armenian people who have been subject to diasporic dispersion for centuries. Um, the history of our objects is also one of diasporic dispersion and that with each, each circulation and each relocation that the objects require, uh, acquire a new narrative and a new palimpsestic here at the very last moment, the palimpsest comes in, a new palimpsestic layering um, that isn't a loss, but I think in fact can be thought of as the gaining of new signification. So I would say in response to that question, um, I can't conjure up any specific examples beyond the one that I just gave of the um, digital repatriation project. But I would say that any act of um, digital remediation or resituation of cultural monuments is an act that doesn't necessarily constitute a loss, but I think constitutes the acquisition of a new, a new form of meaning. Thank you so much for that answer. And I think maybe Vahe would want to say something or, or I'll speak for you. I mean, I think Hushamadian is an example. And I don't mean to, to as we discussed, I don't mean to automatically connect this specific history and situation to Hushamadian, but it's an example of a sort of potential project of digital uh, repatriation. I don't mean to like uh, misuse the term, but it creates but its own space. Go ahead. <laughs> I mean, hopefully now we are not in the same case. Now we, uh, I mean, uh, in uh, concerning the, the memory of uh, Ottoman Armenians, we are working only with traces, uh, really traces. And everything that we find uh, from that past for us is a treasure that could be a photo that could be a family object that could be a anything i mean these traces for us are treasures and uh, if we are able to reconstruct it uh, through different means that could be digital means or other means for us uh, already is something that we are uh, we we have we, we have saved so so we we don't have that issue in in, in the ottoman armenian reconstruction uh, memory reconstruction process and uh, so but here i don't know um 
uh, if there are sp spiritual obstacles or, or, or other things, uh, I hope no, because it's, uh, again, uh, if there is any possibility to reconstruct something differently, we are now in the, in the times of technology. So it's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's uh, again, it's a solution. Thank you, Vahe. Uh, thank you all. And actually, Elena, I would love to hear your thoughts, especially because you also work in the art world and you know have a, a very singular perspective on all of this. Is there anything you'd like to add? Um, I don't know how much I'm allowed to say, but I, I think uh, we'll soon see a some sort of digital project about the monuments, uh, cultural heritage objects and art saw. Uh, including, I'm hoping, a few 3D walkthroughs. Um, of course, it, it's never a substitute for actually physically being there and being able to use uh, those objects for your devotional practice. Um, but if there's anything that we can do to make sure that others can experience uh, truly the treasures of Artsakh, uh, it's commendable. Thank you so much. And on that note, um, I think we'll bring the event to a close. I do want to say just a few things before doing so. First, I'd like to share some of the sources we compiled. Where are they? Oops, not what I wanted to share, hang on. Um, all right, one second. Hmm. One second. Do you see them now? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. I hope you didn't see my desktop. <laughs> um, so <laughs> here are some sources that were mentioned today. Um, if you're interested in learning, uh, the ones at the top are academic sources and uh, the ones at the bottom are from uh, um, publications such as the Los Angeles Review of Books, and public orthodoxy. So those are the two excellent pieces by two of our speakers, uh, as well as um, a few other important pieces. So if you are interested in doing some more reading, go ahead and consult those, take a screenshot of this page. Um, this recording will be available on YouTube and on Facebook, so don't worry, um, you'll have access to it. All right, on that note, I would like to Oh, first, um, audience members are wondering how they can reach our speakers. Uh, I don't know if you have any comments on that, on what you prefer. Email, I assume you're searchable online. <laughs> Anything to add? Uh, in my case, it's they can contact Hushamadian. And... Great. So contact Hushamadian. Through the website. The website, excellent. And for Mashinka and Yelena, I'm assuming email is the logical way. Okay. Um, great. So on that note, um, before I thank the speakers, I do want to say that if you're interested in learning more about this, uh, you can consult a very useful website a Zoravik member made called help artsakhcard with two R's, dot co. That includes um, articles, action items, etc., fundraising items. So go ahead and um, look into that if you're interested. I would also like to thank a few people for their help behind the scenes. Christine, Lisa, and Nunig, who prepared the beautiful poster, uh, which I think matters. So I'm very grateful mm -hmm. to have her brilliant um, graphic design skills. And finally, as I said, the video will be available on the Zoravik YouTube and on the Zoravik Facebook pretty much almost immediately. And as we part ways, I really want to sincerely, personally thank all three of our speakers for their rich, knowledgeable, and brilliant, articulate presentations. Thank you so much. And uh, that's it. Let's uh, hope for the best. And I think the best involves every single one of us being active, thoughtful, and uh, working together. So thank you so much and have a good evening.